All right, good morning, everyone. It has been a tremendous blessing to be here already today. Thank you, Jonathan, for those very insightful comments this morning about choices we make. And Brother James, we should wind the clock back about 25 years and you could probably function as the next pastor of this church. So, very, very good thoughts shared this morning. He was willing to take on the subject and not skirt the issue. So, thank you. God bless you for that. It was a real blessing. Well, this is in a significant morning. This is getting the ball rolling for the upcoming ordination of a leader for the Bland and Mennonite Fellowship. And I guess this has been in the works for quite some time. And dear brother Larry has willingly kept on shoulder, his shoulder to the harness. And uh, maybe it is about time that uh, he receive some relief and someone else come along to uh, fill, fill those shoes. But um, we do have a sheet here we're going to hand out this morning. I don't know who the sheet hander outers are at Blandon, but whoever they are, I guess I shall have to appoint them. Is that right? Is that what I got to do? Okay. So uh, uh, let's have the, the two young men, the furthest back in the room, those two young men way, way back there. Why don't you come up and uh, hand these out? Thank you to Brother David for copying them for us. And, uh, you know, they go to the membership, but I think there are plenty there. So hand them around. And in a few moments, I'll be reading that, and you can follow along with that. And what it does is it describes the process, the process that is going to be followed uh, in the ordination. And so it is important that you sort of have an idea of what is taking place and how you are welcome to participate in the process. So I'll wait till you have them handed out and then I will read them, or read the paper. And it's pretty self-explanatory, it's not real complicated, but it is certainly good to know what is happening. Okay, is anybody, anybody still need one? Does everybody have a paper that would like one? Okay, thank you. All right, I will read this and uh, make a comment or two afterwards. Um, starting at the top, January 10th, 2021, that's today, a fact sheet for Blandon Mennonite Fellowship Minister Ordination. I'll stop right there and tell you this, okay? This is the maiden voyage, okay? Th this, this bishop has never gone through an ordination process before. So um, I shared some comments in Sunday school class about being forbearing. So you might have to be forbearing with me because, uh, you know, we're hoping the, the ship isn't too rocky and we're hoping nobody falls overboard or anything like that. But uh, we haven't done this before and so we're going to try to keep, and I, administration is not my, my highest gift, okay? And so I will try to keep things running smoothly and in the right direction and hopefully January the 24th, approximately 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there will be a new leader ordained for the Bland and Mennonite Fellowship, which will serve in that capacity in a very effective way. All right, history. The request for ordaining a minister was approved at the Bishop Committee September 4th, 2018, and that was actually before I think I was part of it. Ordination was planned by the Bland and Ministry team for January 2021, and so here we are, and we are arrived at that time. Number one, there will be two qualification messages, January 10th, 2021, by myself, Ted Steinrook. January 17th, 2021, Michael Burkholder will be here next Sunday. Number two, after the message on January 17th, nominations will be received by the membership of Bland and Mennonite Fellowship. Ted Steinrook, Michael Burkholder, and Arthur Dexter will be receiving the nominations. Each member has the privilege of being to be involved in the nominating process. A minimum of three votes will be required for one to be considered for ordination. If more than one is nominated, qualified, and willing to serve, the lot will be used to ascertain the Lord's will. 
Married couples are welcome to come to the council room together. They will be given opportunity to present nominations individually or jointly. Absentee nominations may be given to Ted Steinrook or Arthur Dexter in a sealed envelope prior to the service on Sunday morning, January 17. The envelope shall be clearly marked on the outside nomination for ordination at Bland and Mennonite Fellowship. It shall include the name of the person nominating and the name of the nominee. Only one nomination per envelope. These will be opened in the nominating room during the nominating process. Brethren who are eligible for nomination will be those who meet the biblical qualifications for ordination. You can read them and we'll refer to these somewhat this morning and maybe Michael will next week as well. But 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 13 and Titus 1, 5 to 9 and are active members of the Blandon Mennonite Fellowship. The deacon is also eligible. Names of the nominees will be announced before dismissal, January 17th. If you have any concerns about the nominees, please contact Ted Steinrup no later than Monday evening, January 18th, 2021. Nominees and their wives will be asked to complete a doctrinal questionnaire. These documents will be reviewed by the assisting bishops as well as the district ministry. An interview will follow Thursday, January 21, 2021, 7.30 p.m. for each nominee and their wives at Blandon Church. As per Keystone Mennonite Fellowship policy, the ordained brother will be asked to wear the plain suit and his wife to wear the cape dress. Lord willing, the ordination will be held at 2.30 p.m. Sunday afternoon, January 24th, 2021 at Fairview Mennonite Church, 1701 Fairview Street, Reading, PA, 19606. Wesley Metzler will be bringing the message. There will be a light supper following. And so uh, the closing paragraph, we appeal to you as a congregation at Blandon to be in earnest prayer and fasting in the process of this important work of the church. It is our desire to work together in unity and love, seeking and surrendering to his will. May God be glorified and his kingdom grow among us here at Blandon Mennonite Fellowship. In the name of Christ, Ted Steinrook, Larry Graber, Arthur Dexter, David Eberly. So uh, please feel free as a church, as individuals to, if you have questions about the process, please feel free to ask myself, Arthur, any of the ministry team, I think we will be able to assist you with that. And a side note to this is, and I'm not sure exactly uh, what to say, um, the Boyd family has not been uh, actively participating in church life here for uh, several weeks. And Russ has actually asked not to be considered as uh, being eligible to, be, uh, to go through this ordination process. So Russ is not, uh, withdrew himself from eligibility. All right, so I believe that is all we need to say right now this morning in regards to directions and instructions and things like that. We will proceed with the message this morning. Um, I invite you to turn to Psalm 23 to begin with this morning. And uh, you are receiving two qualification messages. And because you are receiving two from two different men, and neither of us are in cahoots with one another, you may, you may hear the same information passed to you twice. And if that is the case, then that is an indication that that is exactly what God needs you to hear. So uh, anyway, so we will proceed with this message and maybe Michael will have a lot of the same things to share. Um, but I need not tell you this morning that this is a very important event in the life of the Blandon Church. Choosing new leadership has a long-term impact on the direction and the culture of a church body. Something so significant as a church body, a group of believers, seems like it should not even be left to the weaknesses of and the tendencies of men, but God entrusts his church into the hands of men. It's pretty precious and it's pretty valuable, the church of Jesus Christ. And men 
we have our weaknesses and our faults, but God has placed the care of the church into the hands of men. Hopefully they are godly men, committed to his word, to his son Jesus Christ, and to his people. Brother James made much of being filled with the Holy Spirit today. That is God's greatest gift to me and to you, is his Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. I was reading of Stephen this morning in my Bible. A man who was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to say there's hardly anything more beautiful on planet Earth than a man or woman who is filled with the Holy Spirit. That is glorious. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous to see a life surrendered to God and under his direction. A beautiful thing. It is still a large undertaking, though it is enabled by God himself. It is possible, and it is meaningful, to be a leader of God's people, and this word you're not, you're not expecting. It is enjoyable, okay? It's enjoyable to be a leader in God's church. I have personally found it that way, and so some people look at being ordained to the ministry and they think that is similar to a funeral. It is not, not even close. Serving the Lord Jesus in his kingdom for his glory is a wonderful call upon a person's life. And so if you're here today and you're thinking, well, maybe I'm a, I might just half be eligible for this. Hmm. Man, I'll tell you what. Open your life to what God wants to do and say yes. And if, if God calls you he will enable you, and life will go on in joy uh, afterwards as well. So we're going to talk about a gentle shepherd this morning, a gentle shepherd. First of all, I want to, I want to tell you that uh, the, the leader who is going to be called is going to be named various things. Okay, now, I have people at Fairview, I will always be pastor. They just call me pastor. They say, Pastor, come on up, preach a sermon this morning. They come up, Pastor, you know, they, that's, what, that's my name. And that's one of the names of the leader. Uh, you might call him a minister, a leader. He is also going to be a team member. But each one of these has special relevance and significance. Um, the pastor is a shepherd. And he watches out for the sheep. He makes sure that they are fed, that they are watered that they're healthy and that they're happy. That is the work of a pastor or a shepherd. Then we have the word minister. You know what the word minister means, right? Servant. He's a servant of all. And a leader is one who provides direction and he carries a degree of authority. Okay, that is a leader. And then a team member. This is important to keep in mind. A team member, the person that is chosen to this work is going to have to work with the team. And if you notice, they don't get along with a team. <laughs> maybe that's, you know, maybe that's, you know, not quite sure you want that brother to, uh, maybe he needs to straighten him out, you know. Uh, no, that's not the idea. He needs to be a team player. Somebody who can sit down at the table, share ideas, share insights, and work together with those that are already on the existing ministry team. So first of all, uh, this morning, not first of all, we're going to focus on the first of those this morning, that being the pastor or the shepherd, and he is going to be a gentle shepherd. We're going to look at Psalm 23 this morning, and we all know that this psalm specifically refers to the Lord, but we are going to apply it today to the pastor, who is the shepherd of God's little flock. This message could be broadly applicable to anyone who is any, in any type of leadership role. Um, I had you turn to Psalm 23. Keep your finger there, but turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, first of all. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this is telling us about a gentle shepherd. It says here, it's verse 24, 2 Timothy 2. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, 
in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. I want us to please take note of the word gentle. He is not to strive. He's not to be a person of conflict, but he's to be a person who is gentle. Okay? Everyone needs a gentle shepherd. He's the kind of a shepherd every sheep needs. You know, the world is a hurting world. And the people of God at times are hurting people. The children in your household are sometimes hurting people. And when a hurting person needs help and healing, what do they get? I've observed years ago, I was a teacher at Fairview Christian School for many years. And I observed many hurting young people. And so they act badly at times. They do things they shouldn't do because they're trying to get attention. Uh, they want attention no matter even if it's the wrong kind of attention. And what comes at them sometimes is more hurt. More hurt. A hurting person behaves the way they do and they get more hurt by those that should be helping. And so we don't want to be that way. I've learned a lot as a father. The hurting children need a gentle shepherd. They don't need more hurt. They don't need you to come back at them with anger and words that are hurtful. They need healing and they need help. And so the shepherd needs to be gentle. Sadly, many a shepherd adds hurt to the sheep under his care, and this must and should not be. Psalm 23, verses 1 to 6. We're going to go through these verses sort of individually, sharing a thought at a time. But we all know this so well. Uh, it starts out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> so what does that mean about a sheep? If I shall not want as a sheep of the Lord, that means that he satisfies my needs. He satisfies my heart. And a shepherd within the church is one that people are glad to be under his care. They're glad that he's there. They're glad they're under his care and his authority. And so this must be the pastor's goal is to have a contented flock. This is achieved through proper care, through nurture, and relational success. Now that terminology, relational success, what that means is that people feel loved in his presence, okay? There are people that when you're around them, you don't really feel loved. You just don't get that. You don't get those good vibes, if you know what I'm saying. It doesn't come through. And a shepherd or a pastor needs to be someone who people feel cared for when they're in his presence. The sheep that it talks about here are satisfied, content, and secure. And like I said, this message could have very broad application, but in this sense here, we're going to say, this could be a quote by anyone at the Blandon Mennonite Fellowship. This is my pastor, this man right here. These are our leaders. I am content with that. They care about me and provide what I need. Okay? I shall not want. In other words, it is a relationship of security and friendship and love verse 2 he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters the pastor's goal must be well fed sheep okay and so the the dear brother that is called to be in leadership here at bland and he needs to be feeding the sheep first peter 5 2 says this, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, 
but of a ready mind. If you look at that scripture and you compare it to the way things are in our churches, it's hard to imagine that anyone would want to be a leader in the church because of the filthy lucre. Uh, maybe somebody is sitting here today and they're thinking, you know what, this is really going to enhance my income to be a leader at the Land of Manor Fellowship. I think I want to be the preacher because it's really, I'm, I, man, I'm not going to be, oh, I'm going to walk sideways because my wallet's going to be so heavy. No, it's not that way. Instead of for filthy lucre's sake, you're doing it of a ready mind. In other words, you want to serve, you're willing to serve. There's blessings in serving. There's sacrifice in serving. But we're willing to do it. We do it with a ready mind. Not by constraint. Not because you're forced to. But because you're willing. You know what? Some of the most beautiful words. I've been involved in a few ordinations now. And uh, I've, I've, I was few, through a few of them myself. But there's a question on the, on the questionnaire that comes out. And you're supposed to fill out your doctrinal statement. And there's a question in the t there that says, Are you willing to serve? And invariably, I cannot hardly believe it in the society we live in, in the culture we live in, in the age we live in, there are people that say, yes, I'm willing to serve. And I look at that and say, God bless you. God bless you. Nobody's making you do this. You're not going to get a lot of money for it. It isn't necessarily something you've always aspired to do. But the church is saying, we need a leader. And you're willing to say yes. That's unusual in this world we live in. What I want to do is what matters to me. You see, we live in a society of people that, that basically, whatever brings me the most pleasure right now, I'm going to do it. Okay? That's, how we, that's how we live. Being a leader in God's church has long-term benefits and blessings. But instant gratification? Probably not. But we're willing. Yes, I'm willing. So the, the leader, he's willing. Uh, and, it, and it says, first thing it said there was feed the flock. <clears throat> now, feeding the flock is definitely not referring to fellowship meals back in the hall back here. Okay. Um, maybe James understands the idea of feeding the flock with that kind of stuff, okay? But feeding the flock is, is the, the whole concept is to be preaching and teaching the Word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul, in writing to Timothy, says, I charge thee. Now a charge, uh, that's going to happen, okay? There is going to be a charge given at the ordination service. The charge is, these are your duties. These are your responsibilities. You are being commissioned to do this. It's a charge. And so, Paul gives a charge to Timothy. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So what did he say preach? Preach the what? Preach the word. Preach the word. And I tell you what, what a blessing. God communicated words to man. I don't know how he did it. What is the language of heaven? What language does God speak when he talks to the angels? Does he talk English? Probably not. Does he talk German? Probably not. Does he talk celestial? I don't know. Whatever that is. I guess so. But God has heavenly celestial language that fills the heavens and somehow he was able to translate that into words that man understands. That's a miracle. A miracle of translation of the thoughts of the eternal and the almighty God translated into language. I can read. Yeah. 
I get that. I understand it. Makes sense to my mind. That's a miracle. Okay. And the fact that we have this document right here, we have this book right here, we have black letters on white paper. Maybe some of them are red. Okay. But the fact that we have God's words in this book is astounding, remarkable, and miraculous. And it's God's word. And so this is what is dynamic. This is what is life-changing. This is what God wants to communicate to you, to mankind, to everyone. It's what is found in these pages. And so we could preach a lot of other things. We could preach somebody else's ideas. We could preach from social media. Shame on us if we try. We could preach somebody else's ideas. We could preach from, I, I'll talk, give you a little illustration here. Before I do that, though, I'll say this is the top priority. Feeding the flock of God and preaching the word of God is the top priority. It is the apex. If you like the word zenith, it's the high point of the calling of a pastor minister of the church is this is to be done to the exclusion of all other things that we could talk about it's to preach the word of god years ago i had a student in my class her name was liz and liz was a dynamic young lady she had given her heart to the lord she went to the baptist church she heard the gospel she said yes to the lord he came into her life, changed her heart. She went home to her grandmother. She said, Grandma, you need to come down to the Baptist church. They preach the gospel. And so the grandmother said, well, okay. She was a Lutheran all her life. She went down to the Baptist church down the road. She walked into that door. She sat down in that pew. She heard the gospel. And grandmother got saved. Beautiful thing, a grandmother and a granddaughter both serving the Lord together. So she was one of my students, this girl. The grandmother came in for parent-teacher conferences, and I knew a little bit of her story. And I said to her, I said, and I called her by name, I don't remember her name anymore, but I said, you were in the Lutheran church all those years. She said, yes. She said, no, I wasn't just in the Lutheran church, I was active in the Lutheran church. I was on this committee, I was involved in that ministry. I did this and that in the church. And so it wasn't like she was just a bench warmer. She was a busy lady in the Lutheran church. I said to her, how could it be that you were in the Lutheran church all your life and never heard the gospel? I said, what do they preach? What do they preach? And I'm not putting down Lutherans today, okay? That's not my purpose. But she said, and this is not a direct quote because I do not remember what she said exactly. But this is some of the things she said. She said, they preach the radio. They preach the television. They preach the newspaper. And today she might have said they preach social media. Maybe. But they don't preach the Bible. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a, an outfit, an organization, calling themselves a church? and not preaching this. That's how many churches are. They talk about a social agenda. They talk about how this is an all-inclusive all society here. You can be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do and you find a home here. And, and that's how the church really is. You can have a home here. Anybody can come in here. Anybody can sit in these benches. Anybody can hear the message. To be one of us, of course, we need to repent of our sins and we need to turn, a, turn our hearts and lives over to the Lordship of Jesus. We need to be born again. But it's for everybody. It's, it's open for all. What a tragedy. Churches full of people that have people. Actually, churches are emptying out these days. But to have a church that does not preach the Bible. We know the Word of God is quick, powerful, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God has the authority. It has the power. 
It is dynamic. It is life-changing. My ideas count for very, very little. But this word counts for much. And our passage we just read in 2 Timothy. What is it to be used for? It is to be used for reproof and rebuke. Anybody here really like to be rebuked? Anybody say, ah, I love being rebuked. Not generally. It's what it's profitable for, or it's, it's used for. Exhortation, to encourage us, to build us up. And then for doctrine. Doctrine is important. It is essential. Because it is what God's people believe. So doctrine, very important aspect of the Word of God. And then we have 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. We're still on the thought of feeding, feeding the Word of God. We know it says here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Now this talks about, you know, this is a lot of the same ideas here. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so, the Word of God is essential. Our, our brother, who is to be ordained, will need to feed the flock of God with the pure Word of God. His duty... Now, some preachers, I gotta, I, I'll just tell you flat out, some preachers are more entertaining than others. But that's not his job. His job is not to entertain. His duty is not to entertain. Not even necessarily. Now, there's some education comes across the pulpit. There's education here. Not primarily his duty is to educate. There are some that are very good at taking what is simple and making it complicated. Did you ever hear a preacher like that? He was able to take something simple, something that could easily be understood even by the youngest children in the church, and he can somehow spin it up in such a way that it comes out really... I, I have no idea what he, what he say. I don't even know. And because of my lack of intellect, personally, I've had many people come to me after I preach a sermon and say, that was so simple, I could understand that. And I said, that's because I'm not smart enough to make it complicated. I'm just not smart enough. And so the, the brother is going to preach the Word of God, and it doesn't, it's not complicated. In fact, most of the Word of God is, is third grade level. Okay, It's easy to understand. The, the problem comes in when we don't want to understand it. That and I'm sorry to say the things I say. Okay, I, I, I should apologize to everybody that's implicated by what I say. But you know what? Sometimes we think people got to be educated in order to be able to explain this word. You know what happens? People go away, they get educated so they can tell us why we don't have to do it. That's what education often does. I had a Bible. That I, I don't know if I told you about this or not. This Bible here. Okay, it's pretty fancy on the front. Looks really nice. Okay, it's got some gold. Cheap. Okay, it's cheap. This Bible has no notes in it. This Bible has no references in it. This is just plain text. Okay? I had a Bible not too long ago. It's called... The, I won't even call... I won't tell you what it was. But at the bottom of the pages, it had commentary. It was a Bible with commentary in it. And we would be sitting there in Sunday school and I'd be, you know, looking at it saying, what's this, what does the commentary say about these scriptures we're looking at? And invariably, I mean several places, it would say things like, you read it and you say, okay, I can understand. That's exactly what it means. It says exactly what it means. It means exactly what it says. And you go to the bottom and it says, now this does not mean, it doesn't mean exactly what you got out of it. It doesn't mean exactly what the word said. Why not? The reason why not is because they sent somebody to, a, to an institution of high learning to come back and write some notes to tell you why it doesn't mean that and why you don't have to do it. I'll tell you what, there is 
I want to tell you this morning, brothers and sisters, there's a tremendous blessing in taking God at his word and simply saying, I believe what God said. And if he said this is the way I'm supposed to live, I'm going to live that way. It's a tremendous blessing in that. And I wonder, I wonder how many people are going to stand before God and it's going to be a bad day. Because they're the ones who wrote those notes at the bottom of the Bible and said, you don't have to do this. You don't have to believe what God actually told you here because that's for ignorant people. That's for the unlearned people. The people that are not educated, they understand it this way, but we know better. Are they going to stand before God and say, God's going God's to say, you're in big trouble, buddy, because you told people the opposite of what I said. Okay? And so I don't want to put a heavy burden on the brother that's going to preach. Okay? I don't want to put a heavy burden on him. But you know what? Preach the simple word of God. God didn't make it complicated. And I want to, I want to add this. This is something I've, I've learned the hard way, okay? Sometimes a preacher gets passionate about things. And you probably heard a little bit of that just a few moments ago. I was passionate about what I said. All right, I hope it came through in love. I hope so. But a couple years ago, I preached a sermon, and it was about, you know, husband-wife relationships and, you know, some things. And, and I said some things that were really bang, 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 you know. It was like, hmm, you know. I thought there were some things I needed to straighten out from up here, you know. Uh, and, I, and then a brother called me up and said, hey, Brother Ted, can we go out and have, have breakfast together? Okay, sure, sure. Uh, you know, brother, that didn't really come out real nice, what you said there. Was there some specific problems in the church that you're trying to address? Or, or were you just really passionate about that? Or what was that? What was that about anyway? And so there might be some people that are still mad at me about what I said. So this, that's what this, uh, this next comment comes from. When saying something, when saying something that really needs to be said, there are things like that. It must be said in a way in which it will actually be heard. And that all goes back to the whole, that there's one little very simple concept, and that is to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. You can speak the word with passion. It's okay to be passionate as long as it's loving passion. Okay, it's got to be loving. Um, sometimes passion comes out as anger. You're cross, using an old term from many years ago. You're cross about it, you know? But to speak the truth in love is a powerful mix of ingredients that has an impact on people. So I didn't quite quote myself correctly. When saying something that really needs to be heard, it must be said in a way in which it will actually be heard. Speak the truth in love. Verse 3 of Psalm 23, he restoreth my soul. The pastor's goal must be to be spiritually healing and refreshing. The sheep have many assaults on their souls. Okay, You go out there in the world, you mingle with the world, you relate to the world, you got to transact business with the world, you got to go places where the world is operating, and there's assaults on your soul continually. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? It's a warfare. There's a battle happening. You're going out there. It is not conducive to your spiritual life. Okay? Um, I give some illustrations. I've been in places already that were bad for my spiritual life. I, I, thankfully, I don't think it hurt me. But it could have really been bad for my spiritual life to go into that garage to get my car fixed. That's why I go to Arthur. Okay? It could have been really bad for me to stand in that line in that grocery store because of all the garbage lining the aisle. Could have been really bad for me. Praise God, I had the fortitude to, to look somewhere else. All right? The world is against us. The sooner we understand that, the better. The world is against us. This world is no friend of grace. And the, the goal of a pastor must be to restore to bring healing. There are many assaults on our souls. He will at times need to be a spiritual doctor for the sick. 
And this morning we need to understand there is healing for the soul in Jesus Christ and in the Word of God. That is where healing is, okay? It's in Jesus and the Word of God. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is a very relevant issue right here. The, pa the pastor's goal must be an exemplary life. Can sheep be forced and pushed into paths of righteousness? What do you think? I thought, you know what, I want to see how sheep follow a shepherd. So I typed in a little Google search or a, a YouTube search or whatever. Sheep following the shepherd. And very beautiful. It's just beautiful. The shepherd stands on the hillside. You can't even see the sheep. And he calls. I don't know what he calls. So I'm not going to try it, okay? You might all get up out of your seats and start walking up here. I don't know. <laughs> but he calls for the sheep. And, you know, nothing's happening out there. He calls for the sheep. They hear his voice. And the next thing you know, you see one sheep running up the hill. And he put, gives a thumbs up, you know. One sheep comes running up the hill. Then another one from over here. Then another one from... And then groups of them start running. They're all coming. There. Okay, the whole field is full of sheep now. They're all following. They're all coming. And then you see him walking down the road. A whole trail of sheep behind him. And sheep do not, well, do, not do well being forced or pushed in anything. And do you think people are any different? I mean, we have, we have church settings. I don't want to incriminate any church settings. But you have church settings these days where the people are forced. And we talked about excommunication, how people, you know, if you don't, if you don't go our way, we're going to, you're going to, you're going to. Uh, push, push, force, force, shove, shove. People respond very poorly to that. What do people need? They need a shepherd. They need a shepherd that has a loving voice. And they know that in that voice there is goodwill. They know that in that voice there's love. And so the sheep say, I want to follow that. I want to follow that voice because that is the voice that cares and provides. Not a, for, not a voice that is forcing and harsh. We all know that sheep need to be led. And I gave you a scenario a few moments ago of, of green hillsides and sheep following. 1 Peter 5.3 Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples or examples to the flock. It does not work to say, but then not do. It does not work to tell people to do things you are not willing to do yourself. We started a new cleaning program at my house. I know you would never imagine or dream that we need one. But the beginning of the new year, I said, you know, we're going to have a new cleaning program in my house. You know, if your house isn't clean and you're the man of the house, what about it? Buck stops here. It's my fault. It's my fault. I said, we're going to get the whole family mobilized on a Thursday evening. So we put down a list. We said, this is what we're going to do tonight. Okay? It's like, three, two, one. Go! No, not quite. Not quite like that. But, you know, everybody knew what they were doing. Everybody had a job to do. And we made a big difference in a short time. Okay? And I sat in my recliner. <laughs> How many of you think I sat in the recliner? I did not sit in the recliner. I ran the vacuum, and I ran the vacuum, and I ran the vacuum. And my wife ran the mop, ran the mop, and ran the mop. And the children put away and put away and put away. Okay? The leader can't expect everybody to do what they say if they're not willing to do it themselves. So you got to be right in there, doing it, showing how it's done. That's what a leader does. Leads people in the paths of righteousness. You can't lead people somewhere where you're not yourself. Okay? Got to be on the paths of righteousness yourself to lead people in that path. All right. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The pastor's goal must be to be there in time of need. Sheep will walk through this valley. They will face all kinds of disturbance and distress. We need to be there with strength, stability, and comfort. 
2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Please notice the word comfort. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So if you're going through difficulty, um, pastors, church leaders go through difficulty. Okay, It's not always easy. And the trials that we face can turn into a great comfort to those who need that comfort. So whatever distress you may be in, God may be preparing you to be a comfort to somebody in that distress. This is passing along the blessings of God to others. <clears throat> 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There is a chief shepherd. And so we call ourselves leaders in the church. We call ourselves under shepherds. He's the shepherd. We're the under shepherd. And the chief shepherd ministers or dispenses his shepherding through his appointed under shepherds. So we all know today, we all know that the Lord is our shepherd, but those that are our leaders within the church, they are shepherds with flesh and bones. The pastor is God's mouth, God's hands, and God's heart to the congregation. Verse 5, <clears throat> Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. This is obviously a tremendous asset and resource. It is a relationship of great value. So it ought to be between a church and their leaders. A very valuable relationship. Verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is an important and worthwhile relationship. The pastor, I don't want to put too much on a pastor, okay? I don't want to put too much on him, but he creates a positive atmosphere in the church. It's not painful to come to church. It's a blessing to come to church. It's encouraging to come to church. It's a lifting experience to come to church. Positive atmosphere, secure and peaceful. That is the, the type of relationship that a leader has with the church. The sheep agree. This is a place we love to be. And these are people we love to be with. That's how the church ought to be. So the pastor has a large part to play in that. And so that brings us to the end of Psalm 23 this morning. But a gentle shepherd. A gentle shepherd. When you are thinking about who would be a good leader of the Bland and Mennonite Fellowship, think about who would be a gentle shepherd among us. And you can apply all these other ideas as well. So, in closing, may God bless each of you here at Blandon. As you prepare your hearts to hear from God. See, in this process, we are asking God to show us who would be a good leader for the church. So you're asking to hear from God and to lend your participation to this important work. And then whatever the outcome is, this is important that we surrender. See, we see another realm operating right now in our nation, the opposite of the church, okay? We surrender to God's direction. And whoever the leader is, we say, we accept that. Um, and so we surrender to his will. Surrender your heart and mind to what the Lord has for us. And so please continue to pray. Pray God to guide through this entire process. That his great name be glorified in his church. And that his kingdom comes and that his will is done. So, I encourage you, pray fast. Seek the Lord and he will.
you think God's up there saying, eh, I'm really, I don't really care about that? Is that how it is? Is God sitting up there? Let the bland and they can take care of this themselves. No. God is keenly interested. I am in church. Choosing a new leader. God is very interested in what's happening and he longs to be involved and to be included in the decisions you make. Seek his face. Seek his will. Let's stand together.